We'll be doing the archaeology, and th apparently this is this 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 by all accounts oh, glasses. Has, has been one of my has, has been one of my best lectures all year. Which is a bit strange. Um, this is about um, we're going back to Orkney again, and um, and this 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 is a very intriguing and interesting lecture. It, it takes us to other areas of archaeology that we haven't looked at before. Um, and one of them is professional rivalry. The archaeological excavations on the island of Swandro, um, which, are, which, are, which are extremely interesting archaeological excavations, have been undertaken by other universities other than Orkney University. So when Cathy and I went to Rousey, and I ended up in tight places with Bill from Pretend, right? We were not introduced to the archaeological excavations at Swandro, which was less than 400 metres on the coast from the Broch. Yes, Ro Rosie, when you went out there with me in 2014. We didn't even know about what was going on in the island, uh, what was going on in Rousey with this archaeological site at Swandro, which is a bit of a shame, because the archaeological excavations at Swandro have been going on since... Uh, 2010, and they're absolutely fascinating. But the, archae the archaeological uh, universities involved there were, are not Orkney at this minute, so uh, it, it um, see professional rivalry. Orkney University didn't but want is to. Is it on Rousey itself? Yes, it's on Rousey itself, yeah. And it's, it's to the east of the big. Thingy. Right. Yeah, to the east on the coast. Yeah. If they've been on the television, yeah. yeah. There's, there's another broth, or at least one other broth somewhere. Uh, it's not actually a broth. They thought it was a broth, oh. and those are all the details that we're going to look at. Exactly, those are all the details that we're going to look at. So, oh, we're going to have to go back now, aren't we? Um, actually, um, actually, um, it, it, it may seem it may seem that Archaeology Cymru is is completely run by me, but unfortunately, it's not because I've been told that um, the Hampshire w um, trip is not viable, and we've got to replace it with Cornwall. Oh. Uh, and, and oh, we're going to different places in Cornwall, and <coughs> and obviously York is coming up as October. Good. So there you go. That that you know that that I've just been told point blank that I won't have any staff in Hampshire, so um, I, um we gotta go to Cornwall instead. What's wrong with Hampshire? I don't know. People didn't people didn't think it was going to be um, viable. Sorry, sorry. I know, I know. This man was well, right. Anyway, go, go, go to the lecture. So the Noah Swandro, the archaeological uh, background. The Noah Swandro in Rousey, on Rousey, Orkney, um, consists of a large mound situated immediately behind a boulder beach on the Bay of Swandro. The No provides the immediate focus for the work of the Swandro Archaeological Trust. Due to the immediate threat of total destruction <coughs> by the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and this lecture has been so set that all the inputs that I've got from Monday and Tuesday from those classes have been put in today. So it, it really works well. Um, so what I what to so make this work really well, so what I need to do is get my do you know these slides work really well today, seeing as Lynn's not in the room. Oh hang on a minute, it's all gone to pot. Just when it said that. Oh, see, see that, that witch, she's done it again. I tell you what, that, oh, uh, hang on, there we go. Okay. I have walked over it when I went there, not, not with Tom. I walked all the way from, from the thingy all the way to the... Did ferry. you see it? Well, we must have walked over the bumps, but it was before 2010, so there was oh, no true. bricks there. But you could see there was stuff. <coughs> this is this is Swandro itself, and that's the Noah Swandro, the Bay of Swandro, uh, and here is mainland Orkney, um, and obviously we've got we've got a northerly uh, there, so we've got the easterly, the westerlies. So when you've got the southwesterly waves hitting here, um, they're doing a great deal of damage to the coastline, and the, and the archaeology has been eroding um, quite extensively since the site was first. Um, um, thought of in um, and discovered in 1946. So you've got south southwesterly waves. Yeah, but the southwesterly south would be coming from the mainland. They've got no reach. It has to be northwesterly. No, southwesterly. Southwesterly waves. The mainland's there. They're blocking anything coming from the southwest. 
Clear entrance to the Move on, it's being eroded. Okay. Um, described by the rock. When I just go, when I when I do my coastal walks, I talk about southwesterly gales smashing along the coastline. Well, that's here. They're facing. Yeah, but you've got the Atlantic that's Ocean that's all around, and the amount of damage being done to the coastline is irreparable to the archaeological resource, and we have to do something about understanding the archaeological forest lost forever. Way. Moving on. Um, anyway, the site itself was um, was found in 1946, um, and it was thought of as a much disturbed um, stony mound. And they thought that this much disturbed stony mound, because of the protruding circular type walls sticking out and the muds and the rock there being eroded away, must have to be to do with a broch, an Iron Age broch. And they thought it was an Iron Age broch. And the problem is when you think something, something, because there's loads of brochs on the coast of Northern Scotland and Orkney, they sort of thought, well, you know, we've got loads of brochs, so we'll just sort of leave it for a while. But they started to realize that this was not a broch. Um, there was two sets of substantial remains at the site. One, one set of remains at the site that consisted of um, a large chamber complex, which was what the protruding walls were. So they weren't Iron Age, it turns out, that they're actually from the Neolithic period. And in fact, this is the only lecture you can ever get um, that looks extensively at a pit dish um, smithy, which they've also found on the site. The pit dish smithy, the archaeology that's, that's been found at the pit dish smithy is fascinating, is important, and it helps us understand not only Pictish Orkney, not only the Pictish civilization, but what was going on on Orkney at the time the Vikings arrived. And it might actually explain a completely different history than any history that you'd have heard from any other archaeologist, including me, because I, I, I wasn't sure what happened to the Picts when the Vikings arrived either. So the temple stones... Um, they were also sticking out on the, at, at the grass knoll there as well. Nice mm. word. And from various ordnance survey recording of the site and investigations of the mound by the archaeologist that links us directly in with Cornwall, Raleigh Radford. Raleigh Radford was the archaeologist who excavated uh, at Tintagel, only to find all his uh, results to go up in flames when Bristol Museum was bombed in the Second World War. But Raleigh Radford... Um, worked um, his investigations nearby um, at Westness um, on a Nordic set of remains, Viking remains, and within that landscape itself in the 1950s and 60s, he started to see that this site was not only an important site, um, it was going to be completely eroded away. It was extensively seen to be a site that was going to be lost due to um, the, the degree of erosion from southwesterly waves, um, that the landscape was facing. And one, one thing that I can remember uh, from the archaeologist Martin Carruthers um, from Orkney University, he, he said to me, look, Carl, if you ever want to bring a team out to Orkney to record the erosion along the coast, um, we wouldn't be stopping you because the erosion along that coastline um, is excessive, to say the least. And you can't save everything, can you, Cathy, where you look, go to the island of Sanday, and you've got basically huge midden pits from the um, late Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and everything's just being eroded into the sea. Human remains, Kathy remembers seeing them, uh, animal remains, um, building remains, all being eroded into the sea. And there's no way that you can record it all. So what we've got to do with a site like Sfondra, we've got to see what we can record in, in the archaeological record before it's lost forever, and to find the remains of a Pictish workshop there as well, is, is an archaeological gem beyond belief, and it was also in time team. Um, Just to clarify, a brock is a tower, right? A, a brock is a beautiful, slender-shaped tower um, with, with, with walls. With basically, you've got um, two parallel walls yes, exactly. to create the conical, right? And through those parallel walls, from the steps, you, you've got little chambers in there. That gives a building strength up to 12... 13, or in the Brock and Mouser, a, a bit more than that, on mm -hmm. the island of Shetland. And, and Michelle said, why do we organise a trip to Shetland? I thought, 
like driving all the way up there to meet everybody off the plane when they get off because we're she's not going up there on the plane but anyway so um so the brock like structures are completely different from these chambered structures the chamber structures that we can actually look at and actually what we need to do uh, we, we've seen this plan. There, there's West Ness, so it's really basically very bad for excavating there. Another set of archaeologists excavated in the 1970s. Um, and this stuff here is definitely Viking beyond belief. So why, what have we got just, just there, um, a few metres north along the, the Rousey coastline? What are we doing with a Pictish workshop? The, the, the some, now, we need, I've alluded to this. Some archaeologists believe when, when the Vikings were arriving on Orkney, right? They, they, they annihilated the picks, right, which I don't agree with. Uh, the other evidence is that when the Vikings got to Orkney, there was no one living there, right, because they'd all been wiped out by some disease. The other more justifiable thing is that um, the picks got on with their lives and the Vikings got on with their lives. And the other fourth thing is that, is that um, the, the, the Vikings um, used the picks with their farming skills um, to continue on the landscape, providing food for the Vikings, meaning that the Vikings can continue with what they want to do on the island and the pits can continue, and that might be the evidence that we're seeing at this site of, at um, Swandro. So hopefully, what I'm going to do now, I think, um, because I'm using two screens at this minute, oh, I think it's six, it, it's Lynn's fault, it's not on the top. Oh, there, bingo. There we go. <coughs> That's what being eroded into the sea. <coughs> yes, wow. But the one, one thing about this, this is the modern war. Yeah? Well, basically, when, when every time that they're on site for two weeks of the year, and, and this, this is probably one of the only lectures that you're going to get that's actually now, 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 and stuff coming up is, is as fresh as now. Um, um, this is what, what's so good about doing these lectures recently. It's just like everything's happening now. It's great. So um, and it's getting more and more of a struggle as the weeks go on to find more sites like this. But what's happening is that this stuff was sticking out, and that there's grass, the grassy knoll there where this stuff was sticking out. Um, and what was happening, this was being eroded away. So what they do now, they uncover this whole site for three, they, it takes them three days to uncover the site. Because what they do, um, they, they put a membrane over it, then they put small pebbles on top, and they put these types of boulders on top, and then they put massive boulders on top. So you can imagine, it takes them three days to move all that before they can start work on site for two months. And that's the only window they've got. The, the stuff that they're going to be doing next year is massively exciting. Um, um, and we'll tell you what that is at the end. Now, when, I, when, I, when I'm doing these lectures, I, I like to add new aspects into it. But before we get on to this bit, um, um, I the key questions why archaeologists do work, which is what we don't do at all uh, in these lectures. Um, the one thing about what they're doing on Orkney and Shetland is looking at archaeology that's, that's either unique um, or very, very valuable to the archaeological record. And what we mean by that is that when you look at the Ness of Bodga, which is on mainland Orkney, you know, well, right. Um, Orcadians don't look, see themselves as Scottish, so when they talk about the mainland, they're talking about their big island, right? Not mainland Scotland. So the islands are classed as the islands, and there you go. So uh, that's on mainland um, Orkney, uh, the, 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 the nest of um, the, the nest of Bodga, which is massively important. Um, and then you, yeah, you've got the archaeology um, on the islands of Sanday, Rousey. Which, which are unique bits of archaeology that may have existed elsewhere in Britain, but because of erosion and because of human occupation, everywhere else that archaeology has disappeared. So we need to look towards Orkney to see how things worked, uh, to give us an understanding of what's going on in the rest of Britain, for example. Um, how do people survive um, in landscapes <coughs> which are completely bereft of trees? I know there's a big difference between Orkney and the mainland, i.e., uh, Orkney's, an, Orkney's an, um, an island archipelago, but to be bereft of trees is the same experience we ha we've had, we've beheld, where we've raped and destroyed the entire landscape, we've completely lost all the trees, how do we survive? So we look at places like Orkney to see how they survive, because the archaeology has survived. In lots of places in Wales, it hasn't survived because of industrial activity. 
And then you go to places like um, Shetland and you look at sites known as Skatnes and Giles Hoft, where you look at bits of archaeology that are not seen anywhere else in Britain, like Viking archaeology. I might like to say that York is, is full of the wonders of the archaeological world when we look at the Romans and, and, and the Vikings, but there isn't as much in, in the way of the Vikings in, um, in York um, compared to somewhere like um, Shetland and Orkney. Or the whole, you get Shetland and Orkney where whole villages are still there, aren't they, Cappy, on the brook of... Um, um, on, on that thing. Oh, the thing in Watkins. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, yeah. Lock of Brook. <laughs> yeah, you know the one. Anyway, yeah. so... The thing he wants is not to be cracked. He's supposed to know what you're talking about. Exactly. <laughs> 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 well, the <laughs> Brook of Bursley. The Bursley, Bursley. The Brook of Bursley. The Brook of Bursley. So this, this is one thing. Why do archaeologists do work? Um, and I'm, I, did, I don't know if somebody said, I can, I can confirm that the Cowbridge development will probably be suspended. So all that destruction of hedges, ruining of landscapes, destruction of archaeology because they can't sell houses may be suspended. Because they can't sell them. Because as, as people are realising, um, with the effect of Brexit, um, there's less people in the country and we don't need these houses. Um, which development? Which development? Say, <laughs> the big one, the massive one. The massive one. Darren Farm. Yeah, the big one, yeah. Yeah, they can't. They had a fit. I mean, I've only been past a couple yeah. of weeks before, and I went yeah. past yesterday, and there are all these houses everywhere. Yeah. It's, it's not. They it's grown up at such speed. I'm massive massive the living one. Yeah, but they can't. They can't sell the houses. They'll have to finish them one day. Well, they'll have to finish them one day, but they can't sell them. It's no one's got any money. Pardon? No one's got any money. Like going to Ireland, where everything's just sort of buildings with nothing else. Exactly. They have all these new buildings the right in town. Because there's massive great time up there. So exactly. Come in and look at our fantastic. So, so the point, this leads, leads me to this, leads me to this. Why do archaeologists do work? They do archaeological work because of developments like this. And why are they, why are they being at Swan Drew? There's no houses going to be built there. The key questions, what is the extent of the Iron Age settlement and how does this change over time? Now, this is, this is really important. It's, a, it's an intact site. What's going on there? It's, it's built on the Neolithic site, and then, then those blinking picks come in. We need those answers. The understanding of the Iron Age settlement sequence in cultural and economic terms by using archaeological excavation and sampling what we've got there gives an understanding of the truncated world that is archaeology. What we mean by truncated, you have um, Neolithic, and you've got Iron Age on top, and then you've got Pictish, and then you've got Viking there. Um, how all that works, and, it, and there's, there's a massive intercourse between... Uh, the, the, uh, the sense of the Neolithic archaeology, the Bronze Age archaeology, it uses, um, it uses each other. Um, what is the stratigraphic association with the Norse settlement? Um, and how does this inform on the question of the Picts and the Viking cultural interface? What does that mean? We're going to get some answers from um, um, Swandra, and they've got answers. We, we're starting to understand how the Picts and the Vikings work together. The Picts! Um, we, we've got we've got a little workshop which is which is um, from from like here to there, right? This this workshop area is a small workshop, right? How does that work? At the same time that the Vikings are over there, it's it's and and, and it's it's a very interesting building. A workshop for what? Metal working. It's it's an intriguing workshop. Uh, the, the nature and detail and date and all the rest of it, all, all that linking, all the estates, all the changes are to be borne out in that one building in it. And, it, it, and it's completely intact. Um, unfortunately, it's not going to be there forever. Um, it's going to be eroded away um, by natural elements. So they, they've, got detailed, they've got a detailed sense of archaeological excavation there to really give them the answers that they require. Moving on. <coughs> and the other thing as well is, oh yeah, we've got the Neolithic stuff. Uh, the other question the archaeologists got is, what is this chamber Khan? What is it about? W what does it mean? What does it mean to uh, the, the, the later landscapes? You've got a Neolithic site that dates back to five, six thousand years ago. And then how does this relate to a settlement that existed two thousand years ago? How does this work? Um, what's the observation? Well, what, what does this all mean? And, it, and it's this huge interface, it's this huge amalgam of data 
um, that the archaeologists are working on at the um, at this site, the Swandro. And the investigations have to be to create a, a biography, yeah, a biography um, that can only be done through archaeological excavation. And that's why the archaeologists are there. You can't just you can't just leave it. Um, I, I know some of you are probably not going to want to hear this. There's that there's that um, there's that site in North Wales that um, that Iron Age site's but being eroded into the sea, right? We, we've got hundreds of Iron Age sites in, in, in Wales, right? Um, and if, that, if that's one Iron Age site that gets eroded in, into the sea, then so be it. Um, but one Iron Age site is, is, to me, the same as another Iron Age site, because there's loads of them, right? But a site like this, you don't get this type of archaeology in such a well, a fine state of preservation. You know, probably my heart didn't mean what I've just said about that site in North Wales, but what I'm trying to do is give you the stark choices that archaeologists have. Do we put our resources into this site that's been eroded into the sea on Orkney, or do we put our resources into the site in North Wales? My bet would be here, and that's the choices that we've got to make. Which Equally, you could argue that both of those sites are as important as each other, but you've got to be, uh, you've got to be cavalier sometimes. You've got to be realistic. It's more important to some of the Orkney people, but still in internationally recognised context. Yes. They've got yeah. to invest in it. They've got to. And and Kathy's just made a decision, right? She's 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 just made a decision which site she wants to keep. Kathy wants to keep the site in North Wales, and so do I. Yeah, but. But unfortunately, we're, we're, there's those problems with resources. Um, and two, the other thing as well is we've got to see also, um, by excavating a site like this, can we, can we possibly, okay, this is going to go, right? Can we possibly look at sites like this and say, right, is there a way we can actually keep these without excavating them? And, and, and then, okay, we've got to make that decision to lose another site over there. All these decisions have to be made all the time, whether site management. The problem is, when you're excavating a site like this, right, you've had to move all those turf, all the turf there, which was that, 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 that ecology, that, 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 that bio um, flora, its root system kept all the archaeologists together. By the archaeologists working there, they destroyed that integrity, meaning the erosion of the site's going to be exacerbated by archaeological activity. So these, these are the problems that, to sample this world, we've got to make these stark choices. So what do those mean? Why were two um, I, Actually, to be honest with you, um, to be honest with you, when I was teaching us on Monday and, and Tuesday, I was able to say, wow, well, I've got a book on the bookshelf, and I should show them an image. Basically, on Orkney, what it is, um, we, we've got, um, and you've been, you, uh, Kathy, you've been to so many sites with me in Orkney. Um, what, what you've got, you've got, you've got a little bit of a wall, then you've got a turf, you've got a wall, then you've got a turf, you've got a wall and turf, and in there you've got a central chamber. These are different stages of whatever this chamber structure was. So you can imagine, back in the day, these would have been a bit higher, this would be one phase of a large amount, or, or, it, or have enlarged it, or reduced it, all these different changes in the Neolithic period. These are different phases. 2010, what I'm going to do Keep that up there because that's getting you thinking. 2010, they decided at that time it involved Orkney College. At this time it doesn't. University of Bradford and also still involved is the City University of New York that's funding the excavations. That's where the money's coming from to fund these excavations. And the objective was to understand what this is. And they, they know what this is now. Is it a broch? No, it's not. But they have to excavate this to work out that this is, in fact, a very interesting chambered... OK, in its later stages, let's use that word, burial chamber, whatever it was used for before, all those different uses for what this is. Later stages in the Olympic, it was it, it's classed as a burial chamber because there's human remains in there somewhere. However, we do find sites like this that are classed as burial chamber and no human remains are found in there. In fact, there might not be human remains in there because I haven't actually excavated the centre yet. And that's what... The, pro the other problem is with this site as well is to get down to um, this Neolithic stuff and understand it, the Iron Age buildings above have to be destroyed and removed by the archaeologists after recording. There's an important Iron Age site on top of this. 
But, and you're thinking, oh God, oh, they're destroying an Iron Age site and that's important. How dare they? But the fact of the matter is, this is going to go anyway. If the archaeologists don't destroy it, the archaeologists record, take photographs, take samples, record the walls and all the rest of it, right? They remove that lot of stuff and then they go down to the Bronze Age stuff and they think, right, we've recorded all that, go there. Then they record this and in comes the sea and washes it all away. Um, so those are the choices archaeologists are going to make. And you can't afford the sort of really proper wall can't afford you can afford um, scarabray walls to defend something like this if and the problem is with the coastline um, just sort of um, look at little bit of te look at um, technicalities and oh, my son should know I'm teaching him right now um, if, if we if we look answer to Kathy's question oh, that's a lovely I remember the wall going all the way to the ferry along and there's all seals on the flattened rocks and, mm -hmm. and seaweed and eyes of ducks mm -hmm. and you know, so upside down. down. It's meant to be upside down, down but it's north is there. So the, the point is is that these are sticky the out bits. That's the null sticky the out bit. These are the soft bits, these are the soft bits. Now if you if you if you save this little bit here, the seal of road here, and it'll create an individual little island. So that's what you're gonna be left with. A line and to protect, and that means whatever's here is going to be destroyed, and the sea is going to take more of a battering here, losing the um, the, the um, Nordic site at West Ness. So, what those are the choices you're going to make? Do you, do you save some archaeology, and then the other archaeology is going to be destroyed, or do you allow this archaeology to go? Um, um, but you've recorded it, and that's the main thing. They might be there for another ten years investigating this storm beach. It's classed as a storm beach. The right way up, please. I really can't cope with this. Yeah, but that's north. I don't care. It's still on. My father, who was my geography teacher, told me that you put north at the top. So, in other words, I've got to put more. I can work here myself now. So, north is. Oh, anyway. Oh, you see, you've done it to me. Yeah, I see. North is that way. How can North be down there when it's up there? It's not. No, no. It's not it's up. North isn't up <laughs> at all. Oh, no. When people first went to Australia, they put south at the top. We're ducking from you know the north. Yeah. You so should be able to read a map looking at it yeah. with the north at the top, regardless of which direction you're going in. Yeah, James with me, so we've no idea where we are now. Go on. That's why I always the directions in the car, not my Well, there, that's the, that's the side we're talking about with Swandro, right? So this is this is what we're talking about. It's not a rock. It's a. It's not. The, the original site, the original site, which led leads to all the other archaeology there, what was originally a. a, a chamber mm. which uh, was its last use in the neolithic was a yeah. burial chamber right and then it was used in the bronze age <laughs> iron age and now what we're going to do is go to another image because this is the, the kathy has caused so no, much it is better to see that that picture yeah. yes, it's 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 and you can tell that the waves are coming from the north even though oh. i'm reading that west <laughs> <laughs> coming going? south because that land's in the way Right, let's. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm taking no notes of anyone in the room now. <laughs> We're going to go on to it in a minute. Right. So, so the the well, time. Let me get her, please. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so one 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 sort of blasé thing I, I want to say once it because we've got so much to go through today. It's just going to be really quick on this. One, one blasé thing. Uh, th this is. Um, this image itself, and hang on a minute. This image, this image itself, uh, represents one of those structures that's on the beach sort of line. Um, that that there was rubble on top of this. These sort of things were sticking out, right? And um, this is how delicate the archaeology is, and this is the archaeology that we're working on today. Um, and there, there's <coughs> lots of things I could say about this. Is obviously. Um, Structural evidence um, within that sort of area as part of the settlement. 
And this is what's of interest to me. At different periods in time, um, lids of stone, a lid of stone, a lids of stone were placed vertically instead of laying horizontally. Um, there's, there's usually a rule of thumb um, when you go into the, uh, when you go, say, for example, into the Iron Age and the Pictish period, the Pictish buildings, they like to build with these vertical slabs up to build small structures. Um, and the Iron Age archaeology is datable because they're laid similar to this. Um, when I say similar to this, this, is, this, this, this archaeology um, relays um, the sense of prehistory that's the dynamic of the site. Um, and the other things you can sort of look at is sort of the staining. The, the, the word truncated, you've got, you've, got, um, you've got this level of archaeology alongside this level of archaeology. So if you want to date this to, say, the Iron Age, and you want to maybe date this to um, that sort of Pictish settlement, but then again, this is where things get complicated, just because they're laying vertically, it doesn't um, mean to say that this is definitely dated from the Pictish period. We've got this building style intermittently in the Bronze Age and sometimes um, earlier and later. But it just gives you a ballpark figure of what's going on. Basically, that's a different date to that date, that over there. That's the way we'll leave that. The, the staining here indicates halves and burning from different periods. So a truncated past, a mixed up past, um, is what the site is about. I'm trying to understand that site before the archaeology is lost forever. Um, within, the, within this landscape, we're finding um, various middens. We're finding, um, we're, we're finding various bone from various different animals. These upright stones, if you want to keep the word, are known as orthostats, which is an, a stone which is um, are now placed on the vertical rather than on the horizontal itself. And you can imagine that if this was allowed, if this was left, um, for a whole year, exposed, this would no longer be there. This has survived thousands of years and it would no longer be there. Because up until the archaeologists excavating there, this is all covered up in really intense, thick mud, um, gradually being eroded away. But the, 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 the um, coastal um, erosion has exacerbated over the past 60 to 70 years. As, as Cathy would attest date from when they, when they found, for example, Scanner Bray in 1850 on, on mainland Orkney, that, that was found due to um, a ferocious storm in 1850 that revealed these buildings. The, the storm conditions have, have, um, have exacerbated over the past 100, 150, 200 years. So this is why this archaeology that survived thousands of years is now massively under threat. It's not going to go next week, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be a couple more decades before it's, uh, it's gone absolutely forever. So what I'm going to do now is... I decided when I was, when I was going through this lecture, um, it, it, was a, it was a brave decision. I, I, had all the, um, I had all the excavation notes. I had notes and images, notes and images, notes and images. I thought, do I go through every single year for the past 10 years, right? Or do I actually cut to the chase and think, right, a little bit about what we've done in 2010, a little bit about what we did last year, and then a little bit about what we did last week. And I thought that would be more appropriate because now we're getting to the nitty gritty now of this year and last year. So I thought that would be best rather than going through the te tedialities. I know that's not a word of the archaeology itself. So... I think what I need to do is cut to that chase and go directly into this wonderful Pictish building. And then we will come back to the Neolithic stuff. Again, this lecture's truncated because the archaeology is truncated. It makes no sense um, when you're looking at the archaeology that somebody's working on Pictish stuff over here, somebody's working on Neolithic stuff over here, somebody's working on Iron Age stuff over here. That's the nature of the beast in archaeology. It's all mixed up. Try and go into the archaeologist's mind, which you don't want to. Michelle's been trying to experiment with that for years. So, uh, ah, that there? What could they be there? Right, let's just move on. If you're seeing what I'm seeing. Look at this building. 
Now, I mentioned something about upright stones and vertical stones and horizontal stones. Actually, when the archaeologists was excavated in this room, they could have thought, right, this is Neolithic. And they thought, no, it's not Neolithic. What date is it? You know, uh, um, floor level is subterranean. It's sort of, it seems to those layers of the Neolithic period, it's got to be Neolithic. And then, no, uh, they found out that this, in 2017, identify it in 2018 proper, that this is a Pictish workshop. You're, you're into a Pictish workshop. This is what's going on. It's got all the evidence for a Pictish workshop. Um, it's, it's, got the, it's got the evidence of bellows, the ture, which is the little bits at the end of, of the bellows, which I know I've got the word wrong, but that's me. Uh, you've got evidence of um, metal, of, of, of copper, um, zinc, um, iron, and tin. You've got evidence of the crucibles in here as well. You've got two hammer stones. And you've got the, um, the handprints of the Pictish smithy himself. And you're not going to get better archaeology than that. Actual handprints of a Pictish smithy. Whether they were male or female, I don't really care. Uh, you've got the handprints of somebody that worked in this building um, at 1,500 um, um, years ago. So um, 1,400 years ago, we got the evidence from, from, from the actual person. And they reckon that they can probably get the fingerprints from that as well. It just is so fine detail. We're getting a little bit of a squeal of the pig on this archaeology. Um, so the Pictish smithies um, floor had been identified, as we've already said. And what they started to find was they knew it was a Pictish building. It was a subterranean Pictish building um, because they found metal working debris there. So it can't be Neolithic. They had no metal in the Neolithic. Can't be Bronze Age because they had no iron in the Bronze Age. Um, could it be Iron Age? <coughs> well, no, because we've done radiocarbon dating in there and all the evidence tells us that this is from the Pictish period. There was metal working debris of, of iron and copper, um, spheroidal um, slag, um, hammer scale. Basically, um, spherical slag is basically um, slag that's um, as, as a residue of metal working. Hammer scale, which would be more um, akin to what, you, what we, we would understand. Ha hammer scale um, suggested of sophisticated blacksmithing including fire weld. Hammer scale is when you bang something with a hammer and little bits of metal go everywhere. Did you ever see that episode of Time Team where they were find, trying to find a blacksmith's workshop and they couldn't find it? They spent a whole day trying to find a blacksmith's workshop. And um, one, one highly intelligent um, female university grad said, um, you want to find a blacksmith's workshop and Phil Harding and and all the great archaeologists back on that episode said, yeah, we want to find it. We can't find it. It's obviously not here. She said, I've got something in my caravan. She went to the caravan and she got a magnet. She went into the spoil heap and the magnet had these little flecks of iron in encrusted on the magnet. And she said, look at this. And, it, and, they, and they, I, I can't say they got bucket loads, but they, they, she said, this is how you know. And, um, and I think Phil had him said, you know more than me. Um... Uh, and um, Professor Aston, they were all there. They, they were quite shocked. And this, they, they found it. It had been removed, but in the spoil, you had evidence of the metal working. And then you can work out from those little flecks of metal, from the metal working, where that metal comes from, um, and they found it. However, this isn't a site like that. This is where they've got everything. They, they, they've, got, they, they've got the evidence of archaeology. Not only have they got... Um, Black, all, all those little bits of scale and all that wonderful slag. They've got the crucible fragments as well. The little bits of the crucible broken. And those crucibles would have been held with a tong and would have been put, you'd have had a little crucible that size and you'd have been pouring <coughs> into a mould. Um, and or, or, and, and, and you, it's amazing that you've got that. Um, so you've got... Um, You've got evidence that they're, that they're working brass and bronze objects there as well, as well as iron. 
this is somebody who knew him, his or her salt. And when I say his or her salt, who are the ones who were the blacksmiths um, in the First World War? It was the women in Britain. Um, we had very competent women in Britain who had been blacksmithies for years and years, but they couldn't go down on the national surveys because the men were meant to be the smithies. Women have been smithies throughout history, and within a society like the Picts and the Vikings, it's likely that um, women would have equally have been used as well. Subsequent analysis of the crucible fragments um, revealed on some of the crucible, and if we, if we take this, when you... Um, when you, if, you, if you don't wash a cup, for example, um, residue builds up, yeah? Um, and that residue can keep building up and building up, you know, with, with the tartarin from um, um, tea, for example. Um, and that's going to build up, build up. And, um, and what, the, uh, what the archaeologists do is in, say, 50 years' time, you take this and the, the build up is still there. So what you do, um, you use a technique known as um, um, fluorescence dating, um, the essence itself. And what you do, you remove that and you've got the equipment to, to analyse um, the, the essence as it sort of goes into the atoms, into the atmosphere, and that can date this to within a few um, years of when this was last drunk out of. That's the technology that they've got these days, the essence. And when, 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 when we've got that, um, that's um, fluorescence dating, thermal luminescence dating, is, is when you look at um, the same technique, really, and you look at, um, um, for example, the Ethlington horse. They know exactly when the Ethlington horse, um, when one of the early scourings of the Ethlington horse occurred 3,000 years ago, using that technique. Not radiocarbon dating, not dendrochronology, real scientific um, dating techniques. And, they, they, and, and also, um, um, fluor fluorescence dating as well, um, the actual fluorescence dating, um, they're able to um, understand the composition as well um, of, of, of that residue. And they, they, they've got um, high levels of zinc being used. Don't use, usually use it with brass in my lectures. Um, bronze as well, they've, they've, got, they've got tin ending up at that locality. So zinc, tin, iron, copper, forget the gold, that's boring. Um, but, the, the, but these people are working in all those materials that would have had to have been brought there. Okay, would have had to have been brought there. And the floor was carbon rich, and the hearth demonstrated various phases of what was going on with the site. And there's also one other resource that we've missed out on. These people must, must have been highly effective in what they created because undoubtedly, to get the, the levels of temperature that they required, they must have used coal, um, and that, or they must have used um, high levels of really good quality um, charcoal. And what does the island of Rousey lack? Trees. So this stuff would have had to have been brought on. What does Orkney lack? Trees. So you would have had to have brought all this, most of this stuff. There's very little iron on Orkney. So, so we this know would that have they had no trees at that time. Most most of the landscape, right? One one of the theories is is that the reason why the Picts were in such a bad state by the time the Vikings got there, say that's the case, is because um, their their diet had so collapsed because most of the trees were gone, most of the rich landscape, most of the bit rich bio uh, flora had decayed and, and fauna had decayed. So, so it's because of the lack of tree, that wonderful tree cover that, that provides a wealth of resource. When that goes, you have that decay. This is what we believe. Um, and, it, it, and also, the other thing as well is, Andrea, is that um, Rousey is the epitome um, of, of Easter Island. Rousey itself, um, Colin Renfrew, um, who's Lord Colin Renfrew, who's the only archaeologist in the House of Lords, um, he, he, he did a survey of the whole of the island of Rousey and he said that the, you had um, one of these burial chambers in the Neolithic period and you had a community, right? <coughs> and you had a number of these across the island. So that would only indicate that because you've got all these people on the island, they had to live somewhere, they had to build with something, even in the Neolithic period, the trees were gone. So by the time the Pictish period comes... This, all these resources have to be brought onto the island. You could argue, for example, that um, you could get 
all, all of what I've just described, the, the, the copper, the zinc, the, the, the tin, and the iron from, for example, Shetland. Uh, have you um, ever been to Shetland on a boat? Um, it's a long way to go. All this stuff has to be brought to the island. So this one individual uh, was, was so powerful in what he was doing and so respected. Um, and we've got evidence of bellows, the snouts of the bellows, and the word is T-U-Y-E-R-E, tuyere, or whatever it's pronounced as. Th those snouts themselves, those ceramic stack snouts used for bellows, um, they, they, um, they've been found on the site as well. So we know they've been using bellows as well. Um, you can't, somebody said, oh, well, why can't you use, um, why can't you use peat? Well, if, if you have big stacks of peat and you burn them, um, to even try and get to six, 700 degrees C, all the peat would be gone, even using bellows within a few moments, right? Peat itself burns at a very low temperature between two and 400 degrees C. Very, very low temperatures. So you can't use peat. You can't use the um, bladder rack off the beach because that's not going to... Even though Cathy was burning it in the, in the hut um, at, uh, on the island of Hoi. Uh, it or, shrivels up really quickly. So you've got to bring in all this stuff. So this building is massively important. It really, really is. Um, and what we're going to do, I'm going to get through with what, we, what we've been working on last year. And and keep going. So a few few bits of information. I need to. Well, we've got the doorway there. But we've got everything we need. We've got an idea of scale. We've got the hearth. We've got <coughs> the hammer stones. We've got the little niche. This is circular-ish. That's an earlier wall. That's the backing there. This is an Iron Age wall, by the way. Yeah. So we've got everything I need. So I need to I carry on with the description. Subter subterranean. So you're going down here. Can't see them. Shallow steps into here. Tight corridor. Very narrow corridor. Um, leading into this subterranean building with no windows. And why do you not require windows in a blacksmith's workshop? The light from the flame giving you an idea of temperature. This is a really tight building, this is a really small building and it would have been very hot and sweaty and not the type of work that I would like to do. Um, to work down here I, I, I can, I'm not going to be crude but you'd have had to have been all but one single garment naked to have worked down here. It would have been very very hot. Um, so the door opens into this area and you've got evidence of a door pivot. <coughs> You've also got evidence of another door outside that can be. Uh, there's, there's evidence that you can bolt the door from the outside and the inside. So that door pivot there would, have, would there would have been two doors at least that you would have closed in on yourself to work in in this workshop. You'd have, you 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 could not have, have had any drafts. There would have obviously been some kind of a chimney. I don't know where. I don't know where the air is, is drawing into the room, but that's another scientific problem for another day. Strong, strongest um, signatures of copper working um, are defined within this area um, and over here as well with these two stones. So what's going on is that um, you would enter the building, you'd enter the building from here, and there would be the hearth in front, and there'd be the hammer stones. Um, this is called access analysis. So you go into the building, you'd have to go towards the left to be able to get to the rear of the activity going on. That's your access into the building, access analysis. So whatever you're doing, you're facing um, what's going on in the middle. And this is that there, these are anvils. Those are both <coughs> anvils. Elongated blocks and a smaller block. If it is naked, Carl, maybe that's what the birthplace of a sporum is. Um, <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> what if you were a woman working in there? Still want something covering you. <laughs> yes, you, you, your breasts would have to be, be covered with a, with a tight covering. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, like imagine a, a little spark from 
Yeah, yeah that's just little, wouldn't you? moving on. Would they have used anything in the lip to cover the eyes? The, the, thing, the thing is, right, what we've got, we know that this is a, a Smithies, right? But those bits of detail we don't have, how they would have worked in these. Because remember, the roof would have come up here. It's not, it, this is basically standing room only. Uh, there, would, there would have been some flue, obviously, to get rid of the fumes. There, there, there would needed to have been a drawing to here from somewhere. Uh, and I haven't got that data with me. But anyway, um, when, the, when the illustrator was examining this cobble, it's lucky that they didn't wash it thoroughly. Because this, 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 was, this hit the news last year if you didn't find it. That there. Oh, wow. Exactly. That is, and there's a number here as well. Yeah, and there's a number on the other side. Um, so th this cobble itself, um, if I can, where's my, where's my doodle? Um, this, this cobble, oh, hang on, I need that back on there. Right, because these bits here, this staining here, is actually metal. So this has been used as an anvil. So the, the metal's embedded in the stone. Before you ask, what stone is this? This is a sandstone beach cobble. You're going to think, well, hang on a minute, a metal hammer cobble, it's going to... No, it works. Um, it works. I, I don't know if anyone's ever been on a beach and had a huge boulder and tried banging on it with, uh, uh, with, with a hammer. If you keep banging on it in the wrong way, right, you'll never crack that boulder. But one thing archaeologists can, um, one thing archaeologists can assess is, is that there would, be, there would be stress marks in the stone. So we've got the, you've got the technology to work out which part of the stone was being pounded. And Dr. McDonald's, who's, who's doing a large amount of the work on this, uh, is, is examining this cobble. And what we've got, if we, if we go back in to, um, we'll, we'll come to this cobble, uh, and then we'll take a break. Um, and that's Do Dr. Mc, uh, McDonald there. Here you've got the, um, a little bit of a niche, which may have held, um, as Kathy's seen, um, an oil lamp may, uh, ma made of a lumber bone from a whale. And you'd have had um, whale, whale, whale oil in there, <coughs> and that, that would have given you some light in there, but the fire itself would have given you some light. The main thing is that, um, and I'm sure if that was used as a, um, there, would be, there would be staining on that stone as well that it was used. But anyway, that, that's another thing. So the layout is very sophisticated. It's designed, it's designed, it's the design itself is of a smithy. Somebody, somebody, somebody built this as a smithy. It's not a reused building. This material probably reuses stuff from any Olympic building and any Iron Age building. But this building itself, the layout is sophisticated. Uh, the hearth furnishings seem to have, have been constructed as part of the building's primary usage. In archaeology, what we do see is, is buildings reused. Um, you know, in, in, in Viking York, for example, the Vikings are reusing lots of Roman stuff. Right, um, but the fact of the matter is, um, it's a bad analogy actually. But um, with it, with this itself, it's a subterranean building, um, specifically for the use of a smithy, um, and to to re to stop any light in there, the observation of flame colour by the smith would have been critical to enable them to gauge metal temperatures. It's it's quite important when you pour that crucible into a mould. That, that, that you do it at the right time um, and if, if the temperature is one way another you could have you could have extensive um, explosion of the uh, of the crucible of the metal going everywhere if you pour it in the wrong way uh, if the temperature is the wrong temperature by the time you take it from from the hearth itself to the mold which is seconds it could have already set so you've got to be really quick, and everything has to be light generated to be able to pour it. So this is this is vital. Um, where's this here? And, and this stone itself. I think it's absolutely fascinating that you, you've got over here lots of finger marks um, there. That sort of lot of movement there. Lot, lot, lots of lot of movement there. On that side, you've got more marks. 
Because I've been a thumbprint to it on the other leg. Yeah. Ah, uh, right, yes. Thumbprint. That's going to be there. You've got probably more there. You've got lots. This is a palm print. <laughs> so this is all mixing in, yeah. So, so you don't get this archaeology. Uh, oh, but because, Alan, you've gone out there and you did that. Um, my, my, my very good friend, Nancy Rosenberg, is, is as mad as an absolute fox. She is. Yeah. Most archaeologists, if you haven't realised, are frigging crazy. Um, we used to go through um, Shrewsbury um, making strange noises and giggling at each other while everybody looks at us in complete disdain. Um, and it's the same woman that when we went to Shrewsbury, we were eating part of one of the walls in Shrewsbury. It's quite a strange story. We were, we, we, there was a medieval wall there with nice, no, a Tudor wall there with nice bricks, and we were, we were tasting it, going, mm, that's nice. And behind us, forming, was a, was a tour, tour guide with 20 tourists. And the only reason she knew we, we, she was looking at us, she said, this is two archaeologists eating the archaeologist Shrewsbury. The point being with Nancy is that when she was excavating on, on a tomb, in a uh, um, sarcophagi in London, she had, she had a little uh, pot like this, a little pewter pot, right? It's linked to this. A little pewter pot. And as, as, as they unraveled the top of this pewter pot, they turned the lid this way, and they had this cream that met a lead loads cream. And she looked at the top, and, and, and she could see the, the fingerprints of the woman who last used that cream. The fingerprints were there, actually still in the top, in the cream. It was still there. And you could be excused for her just going, oh, wow, that's amazing. But this is how well-preserved some archaeology can be. It's very rare. And this is Pictish archaeology where handprints have been preserved, which is more than rare. This is your unique piece of archaeology. You never get this in archaeology. If somebody could have scrubbed this stone, it would have gone completely, you can imagine. But this is completely well-preserved. It, it, it's there, you can see it. <coughs> and, 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 and fingerprints, that's in the offing as well. I don't, I don't, know, what, I don't know what the technology mm -hmm. is with fingerprints, whether you can... So that person was left-handed, then, yes? If, if you've got that, if, if you face this stone there... Work that out. His thumb's it there, look. He's working with that hand, so he's left handed. No, but he might have picked it up to move it. You could have picked it up to move it, it's mm -hmm. very difficult. Oh, just oh, no, you can think. But Alan and Andrea, you can think with the stone. But if you had a stone with nothing on it, you, you'd be talking off your mm. high horse, you know? You'd, have, you, you'd make no sense. But with what both of you are saying, right? We, we can we can jiggle with that idea. Yeah, we can. But we can't jiggle with it unusually. But you've got the evidence to think that. Maybe he was leaning there or whatever. You know, it's all there. But it's a little settlement, right? Far home. Yeah. Mm. It's quite, quite narrow fingers so when you see some of the sort of people that do it. Like really? Well, they're quite narrow. Yeah. Uh, which people who do that kind of job have got really yeah. fat which Which, says, fingers, which says to me, this, this is why I've come up with this female idea. But then again, female smiths have probably got big... Yeah, they've normally got really big hands. Knobbly, exactly. All that smashing around. <laughs> all that smashing. All that banging. Um, so we've got the carbon stain in. Um, so fi finally, looking at, finally looking at this... Um, what time is it? Quarter. Okay, we, 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 yeah, I'm... I am running a little bit behind in what I want to do. So, um, so what we're going to do, um, we'll, we'll we'll do we'll do a couple more minutes. So I know Pete wants his fag. No, you don't want the bowie today. Oh, look at that! You are. It's already. <laughs> Kathy's impressed. I don't want interruption. We're patiently waiting. The metal working um, building itself um, is unparalleled anywhere um, on the planet, um, and what. What they started, what they started to find, is that um, as as they were removing some of the stones, because what they what they wanted to do was to explore the site a little bit more. So what they did, um, they dug into the site. Where's my little arrow gone? Oh, there it is. Right. So what they had to do, they had to dig into the site to create a sontage to look at the layers. So as I removed remo the, the stones into this site, um, in one area, 
Um, they start to find all little bits of carbon and sort of all the little bit, bits of metal work and, and slag and all the rest of it. Um, and then what they, they did in 2018, this is structure three, by the way, they found this huge hefty wall that this building was actually built into. So this is a Pictish wall. So they, this was actually the foundation of this building. So they actually built into it. They probably demolished this to sort of build the rest of the wall. Um, and this, this takes us to a much earlier time. Um, and this is, a, this is a stone wall that creates a stone wall within a ditch. So the reason why this Pictish building was built in the first place is because um, earlier periods, the Iron Age and so on, there was a ditch here. So they backfilled some of the ditch and they used this and whatever. They built the wall. It was, they were able to build a subterranean structure actually within the ditch because the ditch was already there. So it was a perfect place to put a building. Um, and then what they found is that throughout time, this ditch itself... Um, had been filled with, um, with, with storm or flood surges from the sea. Remember the sea itself, when this site was being used, may have been about 50, 60, 70 metres further out from where it is today. But obviously, that's no reason to say that the storm didn't flood the landscape on, on occasion. And that's, what's, that's the evidence they're actually finding with the site, due to this really chunky wall, much earlier wall than the uh, Pictish wall that we're actually seeing. So, what we're gonna what we're gonna go on to um, after the after the break really? I've got loads more notes here, but I can probably do it better uh, just looking at the images. Um, is that if we move on to the next slide? Go through all these. I covered most of this anyway. Oh, this is the entrance way into that building, those circular walls. So you see these, these, this passageway makes up those circular walls. You've got an air plan coming up. And the, the Pictish stuff is out here. Um, that's where they're excavating. This is the Neolithic stuff. They, this, this tight corridor into this passive building. And they are quite tight, aren't they, Cathy, from the ones we've actually gone into? Mm -hmm. um, so you're looking down the passageway, passageway of the chamber tomb. Um, and... Um, and, right, so this, no, I've got that wrong. Sorry, my interpretation. This, this, is, this is the outside, and this is looking inside. And that's towards the mound, and that's the area that's still got to work. So what we're talking about, the Pictish buildings were here. Okay, I did make a mistake. Pictish buildings here, and this is a passageway, and this is the area they're excavating, and the centre of the bodies are going to be up there. Sorry about that mistake. Um, and this, this is how complicated the, this site is, is because on later periods... You've got Bronze Age and Iron Age archaeology interfering with the Neolithic stuff. So again, this is the outside. We're going into the Neolithic site. Within this site, you've got, bro you've got after the Neolithic period, you've got the Bronze Age, the Bronze Age, uh, 4,000 years ago, into the Iron Age, um, Iron Age, um, 2,000 um, 2, years ago. Um, and all this sort of, it's all truncated. It's all mixed up. And another little image coming up as well. We will have a break after this one. And in the Bronze Age, quite an irony of fate, a little bit of a chamber associated with, the, um, with this Neolithic structure. Um, and this itself is a Bronze Age kist burial. Um, so it's almost as if they're using this site in the Neolithic period, its last use in the Neolithic period was as a, a burial chamber. Um, the irony of time is that um, when, the, when this goes into the Bronze Age, they're not using this big building anymore, but they're still burying their loved ones associated with this building, because it's the kiss burial um, of an Iron Age individual um, directly alongside this chamber that's to be found within this Neolithic um, chamber burial. Uh, if we move on, and as they, they move that, we've got all these little chambers uh, Michelle had to pull me back when we went to Shetland. They, they, we went out to this block in Shetland, and I had a torch, and I said, "Oh, wicked! They, there's, there's all these little sort of collapsed chambers in this sort of block that we were going to go into." And she said, "Don't! I can't get the air ambulance out to you and all the rest." Of it. So I didn't. But these little crevices and holes are the like places that archaeologists love to explore, and there's one crevice that they found on the last day of the excavation in August this year, which hopefully we will get to by the end. So um, 
So I'm going to ask, is there any questions? That's, that's, the, that's the time team excavation. I don't want to spend much time on that, but time team have been there. Um, and this is Swandro 2019. And there is Kathy carrying a bucket. And you'll note that most of the people working on the site and doing all the work are in fact women. There's one bloke and those are all women. So the, a woman's place in archaeology um, is to do all the work. And a man's place is to take the glory. No, I didn't mean that at all. Most, most, most people involved in archaeology are in fact women now. And, um, and, and women are leading the way. So are there any questions? No? So we're going to take a break. I felt that was very good, but I am absolutely, I'm quite, quite exhausted now. So uh, we're going to take a break now, and we'll take about an eight-minute eight break. I'm going, to get, I'm going to get this record. Eight minutes, precisely. No, ten. That's, that's, and I'll, uh, 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 right, who wants eggs today? No, that's not eggs today? No eggs today at all. No. I, I have got 60 eggs, and nobody wants oh, them this no. week. When is it? It's official. Swan Drew is go. First day on site with a full team. Students from Bradford and C U N Y. Not. Not. Oh, that's a bit. Uh, what? Something in New York, something. Yeah. U University of New York, yes. Together with old lags and volunteers. And our first task after the health and safety briefing, basically, as you can see, they've got all that rubbish to clear up. It took them three days to clean the beach before they could even get to the archaeology. Um, and sort of what we're going to do, we're gonna, we'll get through this bit to get to all the um, shenanigans. Um, there's nothing wrong with the shenanigans. Gillian knows all about it. As you can see, they're, they're clearing off the beach there. It's taken them three days to do it. And this is how close the archaeology is. So that's where those walls were earlier really on. So they've got to take all that off, get down to the membrane, and there they are all sitting down. Oh, I would say that uh, those involved in the excavation, as you can see, are mainly women other than that bloke there. And then the men come in and do the other work. <coughs> it would be great for the Yanks to actually see really old stuff by their comparison, isn't it? Mm, they've got some stuff. Here. They've got some stuff. Native yeah, American yeah, stuff. Indian stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Oh, what? Oh, oh, I what? Do you mean the We got the American Civil War. No, I've seen oh, some really seen interesting it. place where they had the markings that, and that were going through it. Of on the, the rock. Stripes on the rocks. Exactly. That is incredible. And lots of earthworks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would show up in future, I think. Um, just don't say anything. I don't any know these bigots when I see them. <laughs> don't worry about me. <laughs> Oh, right, here we go. So, th this, what we've got, we've, what, what I've done, I've done this in a really unusual way today. So, we've, we've got directly, um, I've, I've got their stuff off, off the internet. So, what I'm going to do, uh, we look at their um, internet diaries. Racing against time and the tide at the Knoll of Swandro. Just, just a quick recap. So, the Knoll at the Swandro in the Orkney um, Island of uh, Rousey, as we know, we've got those concentric wars 5,000 years ago. We've got Iron Age um, evidence, we've got Bronze Age evidence, we've got Pictish evidence, Viking settlement nearby. Uh, so, the priority next year will be to um, de excavate directly into the chamber tomb. This is next year, and to um, excavate. Uh, the Iron Age buildings that, that overlie the chamber tomb. They've only got two, two months to do that next year. Our 2019 excavations, which, which only ended just a few weeks ago, showed that there is a complex sequence of buildings, all truncated through that wonderful period of time. And then what we're going to do now, um, I'm, I'm just going to mention this interesting point. Results so far suggest that Swandro was a high status settlement in the Pictish period and this importance continued into the Viking era when it was part of an estate um, associated with Singurd of Westness and it also featured in the Orc Orc Orcadian sagas um, um, from the medieval period so you know this is mentioned in history as well. Were the Picts wiped out? I, I believe that they weren't. They, they integrated within the Pictish civilised world. Uh, the Picts in, integrated in the Viking civilised world. 
it's likely that um, a, a boat the Vikings turned up one day and said, right, we're going to rule over this area. Are you with us, Picts? And the Picts said, yeah. Will you buy our iron? And they said, yeah, that's fine. And the things continued, probably. And if you're not, you can become one of my slaves. Oh, I'd become one of your slaves any day. Yeah. Um, goth is already in there. Right, so what we're going to do now, um, we're going to... Um, but she never ran around the Ring of Brodgar with me naked. So, so what we <laughs> what we're gonna do? She did have an opportunity. So here we go. On the first, that's th this. This goes to. Um, um, we're gonna we're gonna all share and read this off together. So um, if I can enlarge a bit more. Oh, there we go, we can read that. And Vimo, excellent. So we can go down the page and hopefully um, this is gonna work. So I need to get that, move that over a bit. It's, it's Lynn's fault. I need to get that little thing on the side. Uh, right, bingo, there we go. Um, so what, what they're looking at, obviously they, they've got these, the, the um, the conditions that they're working against, and this, this dates back to uh, this entry in their diaries from the 4th of July. So we don't go through them all, we go for about six days and that's it. So that's the site that they've now excavated. So these are the um, earlier images that we were seeing. This is now going into the site, and you can, this is where the, all the Pictish evidence is. Um, directly on top of this you've got our Iron, Iron Age archaeology, Bronze Age archaeology. This is the extent of this chambered structure with all these concentric rings here, the chambered stuff that they're going to be excavating next year, but this is what they've uncovered. And you can see the problem is with the archaeology, they've had to take all, all this turf off. And naturally, when anyone knows that you, when you take turf off ground, particularly for two months, when you put it back down, it very rarely re-establishes. So to give you an idea of scale as well, if we, if we go to, um, if you get, get an idea, that's a five metre scale there. So you can get an idea that five, 10, 15 metres across, it, it, it's sort of um, the central um, dia diameter itself. And then what you then have is overall, it's about 30 um, metres across. So it's quite a large site indeed, a very large site. But this has survived, it's intact. This is why the archaeologists are working there, because it's a unique opportunity of getting an idea of a site like this. Lots of these sites inland, they've got mounds on top of them, you can't touch them, but this has to be touched because one day it'll be gone. Um, and that one day uh, won't be long in coming. So what, I, what I've decided to do is, is to look at these wonderful stories and, and look at some of the finds that they've actually been making. And this itself was found on July the 7th. It's known as Claudia's Dragon Egg. Um, I know there's some silly things here, but this is, this is part of the archaeologist's mindset. So obviously, this itself um, is not a dragon's egg, naturally. It's, it's a wonderful, whopping big hammer stone. Um, to be honest with you, um, it's a very large stone to be used as a hammer stone. And it was prob probably dates to the sequencing on site. Um, and it goes, I think this dates from the period of about the Bronze Age. And again, obviously, all these unusual objects. When you're in archaeology, right, one of the one of the hardest things in archaeology is to continually excavate, and you don't find anything, right? Um, and with this site, like lots of the other sites, they they find little sort of nuggets of information. So this one find, which is a bit of a strange find, builds up to all the stuff that has been found up until uh, the last day of the excavation. You can see this is the point. That's where the sea is, and this is where the archaeology is. So you can see that this is really badly, there's hardly anything left here. And the sea is gradually taking all this away. And they, they can't stop it. Um, but this, they're excavating, even, even in July, um, you get an image of from two months ago. Look how choppy and breezy that landscape is. And that's their summer, for example. It's, it's very choppy, isn't it, um, Cathy, in the months that we've been out to Orkney. Very choppy. You can imagine the damage this is causing to the archaeology itself. And 
But as they further move inland, the archaeology is much, much well better preserved with lots of the building evidence that you're actually looking at. And look, at, look, look, it's there, it's well preserved. All the chum, tumble and jumble of this, these prehistoric remains that they're actually working on. And these are the students. And, and can you imagine <coughs> being a student for the first time working on a site like this, and, you, and you're from all the way from Bradford, let alone all the way from the University of the City University of New York. So this this would be this would be amazing. And um, obviously there is some link between um, uh, the univer my university, University of Highlands and Islands, but this work's being done by the students. Okay, moving on. Let's uh, let's look at this one. Now accidental stuff. They're, they're working on sites and then suddenly they suddenly start to work out that there's stuff bubbling from underground. And the stuff bubbling from underground, my folks, is fresh spring water. Um, and fresh spring water on an island. And that is a very important resource. And you can probably start to work out one of the reasons why they're living there is because they've got fresh water. And guess what? By the end of the by the end of these slides, up to here, it says subterranean river. They've actually found a subterranean river going underneath the island. It's the, it's the Swan Row River. They found a river. Archaeologists finding a river. This is a spring, and they've also found a river there. So again, this is this is answering some of the questions why the archaeologists are actually on the site itself. Um, and that's the first bottle of water if you want to buy some from uh, Swandra itself. Um, and what they've got, they've got all these weird little cobbled um, subterranean. Um, this is where this is where they, they're finding the water exuding from. And and they're they're excavating further and further down in this. This again is the state of the very well preserved archaeology. Which are having to, they having to go through all those layers to find out more and more about the, the intense prehistory of the site, the Iron Age, the mixtures of the Iron Age stuff on the surface, then the Bronze Age, then the Neolithic, peeling all those layers away. And you've got to peel those layers away. You've got to move that to get the Bronze Age stuff. You've got to move the Bronze Age stuff. But as it looks now, it's, it's that sort of intermeld, that truncated sense of history that you can actually see about at this wonderful archaeological site. Now we look at some strange objects. Mystery of the day. Th this is, um, we're, we're, we're well into, um, when I'm well, well, well into July, they don't know what this object is. Look at this very strange object. Copperlite. Not a coprolite at all. They, they, they thought it could be, is it to do with a handle? No, it's not. Um, is it, um, and, and, the problem is I don't have an explanation for what this is. It's probably antler. Um, it's, it's found on the site. It's antler. And that's all we've got so far. When you've got fresh you archaeology... Down a bit so I can when, you've got, when you've got fresh archaeology like this, I can't give you answers because this is straight out the excavations. This is, this is weeks old. So, you know, when we hopefully go back to this in, in, in the future, we can say it's precisely what this is. An unusual object found at this site. However... The next image is of something very recently found again, and you'll be able to identify what this is. We've got we've got we've got evidence of metal working on site. That's about metal working. That's about water. But this one here, if you can quickly see that, that's a weaving comb. The teeth are gone, but this is a weaving comb. This is a bone weaving comb from an Iron Age building. So again, this is a piece of archaeology that links us directly to their skills of people. Um, so weaving comb, they've obviously got access to wool. Um, and they're obviously, you know, are they keeping... They have. Pardon? Of course they have. Well, of course they have, but we need evidence. That's the point. So we've got evidence that, they, that, 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 they've, that they're actually weaving on site, and obviously... I would have thought that ugly thing was something that... You tie around the narrow bits. You tie something around the narrow bits, but that could be something to do with weaving as well. It could be. Have you got a picture of the Ah! 
because we haven't got much, because we haven't got much time now, um, what I'd like to do is show you the other object. You got this wonderful weaving comb made to fit the weaver's hand to perfection. And I know what Kathy's talking about there. But we also got Roman glass being found on the site. Now, there's me being particularly interested in the Romans in Orkney and Shetland. And a, a, a fragment very much closer to home of Roman glass. Now, the problem is when you come up against Orcadian archaeologists, there's only two people who believe in any Roman sort of inference with Orkney and Shetland. It's, it's me and my lecturer. Anybody else thinks the Romans had no links with Orkney or Shetland or whatever. But lots of sites we find bits of Roman pottery and, and brooches. And in, even at Mine Howe, they've got evidence of possible um, of, of Roman metal workings at uh, Mine Howe. Not Mice Howe, but Mine Howe. Evidence of trading. Or, or, or trading. Yeah, trading or whatever. But there is evidence of a pure link between the Roman world. However I interpret it, and in Kathy's right in what she just said, We've got this link with the site, Roman glass. So obviously this would have ended up there as a complete object. Uh, it's, it looks like it's not abraded, it's not being moved around in the sea. So there's fresh breaks on it as they look at it in the ground. And maybe there might be some more of this found there. Two more slides and I know Ben will have to call it a day. And look at this. Uh, copper ore, 29th of July, copper ore. Uh, this, is, this is the find of the day. Uh, there's been a lot of evidence of metal working at Swandro, but this is actually the ore itself that's been brought into the site. This was never worked. This is the actual ore, ore itself. Um, and this is actually not from the Pictish period, okay? But this is actually from the Iron Age. They were working copper within the vicinity of the Pictish workshop, not just in the Pictish period. But this object itself dates precisely from the Iron Age. So they're working metals within that landscape for thousands of years. So it continues. And why not continue into the Viking period? Why aren't these this the same family? This could have been a landscape of people working in that trade for <coughs> thousands of years. How many people can say that they've been work their family has been working in that trade for thousands of years? Um, not any I can mention. Tesco say they've been around for 100 years as uh, grocers, but that hardly counts. So, metal work at the site for a very long time. And the final slide, before we call it a day now, uh, is subterranean river discovered in Rousey. And this to the, dates to the 4th of August, just one month ago. Uh, a world underground chamber. And they've got this as well. So what it is, there, there's, there's, there's a link, not the spring area, there's a link to a, submarine, a, a subterranean water channel. Okay, which probably directly links to the spring anyway. But um, so this itself um, is 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 a structure um, which dates probably to the Iron Age. Um, and what what there is, there's another image. And if we go down further, you can actually see they've had to go into this area. And above it is a corbelled roof. It's it's a it's a chamber within the complex there, and there's a corbelled roof above it. You can see the corbelling. It's brilliant. And what this, 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 this structure above this water channel was built for a reason. They're drawing fresh water. This, this is, you've got your own fresh water being drawn directly from a subterranean river itself. So this is what we're looking at. And next year, they'll be examining this further. Problem is, there's not going to be any artifacts down here because they've all been washed away millennia ago. Um, but this itself is something they'll be examining next year, along with the rest of the site at Swandro. Hopefully we'll be able to visit this again. Uh, and on that note, uh, we'll have a look, one more look at, um, one more look at uh, that fresh water, going down there. That fresh water, there it is, it's fresh, it's glimmering. Are there any questions? No? Interesting topic. Have you have you all enjoyed that today? Yes. Yeah. Okay, hang hang behind for a little bit, Jane and, and, and Pete. If they hang on a minute, if I, that cider really is mine, somebody else can have it. Well, I don't Who wants cider in the room? I'll put it back in for next. Put it back in, yeah.
You don't want to carry a bottle of cider through the streets, do you? Well, I did offer to swap the two cans of beer. Do you want a, do you want a bottle of cider, then? Thanks. Do you want two cans of Cali? No, I tried that. Right. I, uh, we, we don't make the cans of All right, then I'll do that, then. Um, and you've got the cream as well, Jane. I have to sort that out. If there's no, you two, I'll just hang around for a little bit. I know. Uh, any questions? Just one from Alan. Could we have a lecture on the Sevso treasure? Please? What's that? Sevso treasure. The Sevso? Yeah, could we have a lecture on that? Where's that? It's Roman it's 14 pieces of Roman silver. Where was it found? That's what we said. Um, where was it? <laughs> Hungary.